I hope the consumer will start to see how B2B is impacting the shopper experience. Not directly, but indirectly. So as part of our mission, we're trying to use technology and B2B platforms to create a conduit where we can influence, educate, and inform and enable our retailers, especially our independent small retailers in the high frequency store space in particular, to be better store owners and to create a better in-store experience, as well as use some of the modern engagement tactics such as social media engagement to bring more food traffic to their store from within their community, therefore strengthening their business and uh, providing a jumping off point for them to become more successful in the future. You may only know Kellogg's as the company that makes your favorite cereal, but there is so much more to the company than just delicious treats. Robert Burst is the head of global B2B e-commerce at Kellogg's, and he has been leading the charge to position Kellogg's as one of the leaders in creating scalable B2B e-commerce strategies. On this episode of Up Next in Commerce, Robert explains all the ways that Kellogg's is upending traditional e-commerce strategies in order to help customers find greater success. Using technology like AI and machine learning, and by developing a platform that all of their customers and partners can use, Kellogg's has been pushing the ball forward on bringing small and large businesses into the world of e-commerce and helping them get the most out of their e-commerce strategies. Enjoy this episode. Up Next in Commerce is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud. Respond quickly to changing customer needs with flexible e-commerce connected to marketing, sales, and service. Deliver intelligent commerce experiences your customers can trust across every channel. Together, we're ready for what's next in commerce. Learn more at salesforce.com slash commerce. Welcome to Up Next in Commerce. This is Stephanie Postles, your host from mission.org. And today I'm very excited. We have Robert Burst on the show, the head of global B2B and B2B to C e-commerce at Kellogg. Rob, how's it going? It's going great. Thank you very much. From captivity. Yes, yes. How is life in captivity? Well, I'm thinking about calling Amnesty International, see if they can get me out of here. (laughs) Well, we were just talking about what life looks like right now, just us eating lots of Cheez-Its on our bed at home, calling into Zoom calls, or maybe that's just me. Maybe that's not you. No, I agree. I think that's, that's, that's a typical picture across the world right now. Yeah, which is okay. Temporarily, it's okay. So... I saw you have a very long history in e-commerce. I think I saw dating back to even early 2000s, right? I'm afraid it was in the 90s. Ooh, nice. Okay, perfect. Well, I I would love to hear a bit about your background and what led you into e-commerce. Sure. Well, I was working for a a catalog distributor, so not not a distributor of catalogs. We use the catalog as our medium to communicate with our customers who were predominantly engineers uh, in factories across Europe. The, um, the business that I was responsible for at the time was a small specialist distributor, and we were struggling a little bit to find our position as you know, e-commerce was starting to take, uh, take more of a, a role in the consumer engagement or the customer engagement in our case. So we under, undertook, and this was the late 90s, undertook a digital transformation, even though digital still wasn't really a bona fide strategy because it was only emerging. But mm-hmm. the first, the first task we we undertook was to create a, a digital asset library from all the bromides and things that we'd accumulated to support the catalog production. So we partnered with a, a startup in London, uh, a bunch of you know basically college graduates who were trying to create the first uh, digital content management system, and that was more than twenty years ago. So we did that, and we started to uh, to create you know, a digital presence online. The, uh, you know starting with static content and then moving into transactional capabilities. And it helped transform that little business into something that was a, had a, a much greater future. So that was my first introduction to digital. And I've never looked back since, to be honest. Oh, that's great. What, uh, what kind of transformations has your career seen since the starting point in the 90s to now? Like, what does your role look like now at Kellogg? Yeah, I mean, I've used digital disruption and innovation in all the roles I've had since that position in the UK uh, to varying degrees of impact. Uh, When I joined Allied uh, and I moved to Texas, you know, we transformed that business uh, collectively from, you know, a couple of hundred million to 600 million in a very short period of time. Uh, Just really ensuring that we unified the sales channels with the digital channel 
in the early 90s, well, the early 2000s, it was very popular to ring fence e-com as a separate channel. You know, I, I felt that was wrong. So, so when we when we moved to 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 the US, I tried to ensure that the unification happened. So it was the best one-two punch we could possibly give our customers. The always-on capability with the human interaction, and and so that, that I've used that principle uh, throughout my career to build success. Ultimately, all the way to Kellogg's, where uh, now I'm using technology to create value for our customers, changing the paradigm that was always traditional and sales engagement of how do I get my customers to buy more? Now, now the, the principle behind our, our, our e-commerce strategy from a B2B perspective is how do we enable our customers to sell more? And then we will be the recipients of the downstream benefit in due course. And that's a big change in, 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 in an approach. So what did your first maybe like 90 days look like when you came to Kellogg's and you saw the lay of the land? What were some of the initial things that you're like, we have to do this or have to shift this what did you do? Well, the train was leaving the station when I joined Kellogg. <laughs> They'd already decided to embark on a pilot, uh, a B2B pilot in, in Brazil of all markets, one of the hardest B2B markets in the world. So uh, mm -hmm. it, was, it was an interesting challenge to, to, to ramp up very quickly. Now, thankfully, they were using Salesforce Commerce Cloud as the technology platform, which I was very familiar with. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was okay. But getting, getting familiar with, with our business model in Brazil, which was a, a direct store delivery model, uh, was a different beast for me, and uh, and then obviously with with Portuguese language challenges, it was yep. it was uh, it was it was it was an interesting ninety days, but it was certainly immersive. You know the the, the saying, you know, jump in the deep end, and you'll either swim or you won't, and that's that that's where I found myself. Thankfully, you're still swimming today, which I am. We all, all I am. are glad about. So, what does your day to day look like now, and how would I think about B two B when it comes to Kellogg's? Because from a consumer perspective, you know, I don't really think about what goes on behind the scenes. I just, you know, go to my local Whole Foods, I find my cereals, or my RX bars, and I don't think about how it gets there or how maybe it gets to a smaller mom and pop shop. So how do I think about Kellogg's B2B experience and B2B to C experience? Well, I hope the consumer will start to see, uh, you know, how B2B is impacting the, the shopper experience and not, not directly, but indirectly. So, you know, as part of our mission, we're trying to use technology and B2B platforms to create a conduit where we can influence, educate, and inform and enable our retailers, especially our independent uh, small retailers in the high frequency store space in particular, to be better mm -hmm. store owners and to create a better in-store experience, as well as use you know, some of the modern engagement you know, tactics such as social media engagement to bring more you know, food traffic to their store from within their community, therefore strengthening their business and uh, providing a, a, a jumping off point for them to become more successful in the future. So the consumer should, should recognize that when they go to the store, if the store is, 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 has always got the product they're expecting to find in the store, and if that product is displayed in a fashion that is, that, that is compelling, and it's positioned next to other products, they think, well, that would be the perfect combination. Then B2B commerce, modern B2B commerce, is starting to have an impact on, on the buying experience. So that's what goes on behind the scenes. And that's what, we're, that's what our vision is built around. Yeah, that is something I never think about is, is this product positioned next to another one to make a better, uh, you know, maybe make me buy more? How do you figure out what products should be next to each other? And how do you work with the store owners to ensure that they um, abide by those rules to make sure that, not, maybe not rules, but it also help them sell more as well. So how do you work with the store owners to create a good partnership? Well, in the past, it was always through traditional uh, sales engagement. You know, the look of success has always been a principle behind how we've engaged our retailers in, you know, in using planograms and, you know, driving compliance around these planograms and the, the science behind them has been, has been well understood and the discipline has been in place for a long time. However, the, the, the cost to serve and maintain that, that relationship and the cadence that, that we need to continue has become ever more challenging. So digital is, is, is helping to change that, 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 that paradigm and allowing us to go back to the long tail and really start to help our, our smaller retailers, you know, to to really become you know stronger and you know more effective in, in their in their day to day life. So we see things like you know AI driving the intelligence around product recommendations for a store type, for instance. So if you are you know a independent store owner and you are in a rural environment environment where you are 
uh, a thousand square foot and two cash registers, then we would like to be able to cluster you with other other retailers just like you, do the analysis and determine what you must stock, what you could stock, and what you shouldn't stock, and then mm-hmm. ensure that we're talking to the to the owner operator on a, a cadence that would allow us to then you know, morph that offer and recommendation as consumers' trends change. So we're always ahead of demand, not behind demand in the long tail. How do you stay ahead of demand? Like what kind of tools and technologies are you using to ensure that you're able to quickly react to, you know, consumer buying behaviors or inventory levels for the store owner? How how do you stay ahead of those things? Well, you're giving me way too much credit to say that we're actually ahead of those things. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're aiming to be ahead of these things. So let's let's make sure that um, that's that's completely clear and we're being transparent. Uh, there's a yeah. lot of work to do here. So what we what, what we see is the ability to take all that historic purchasing information and then combine it with uh, you know social listening to see what consumers are talking about, and then plugging in triggers like weather and other you know you know influences on on, on, on buying patterns and then continue to feed you know uh, you know machine learning and, and, and AI logic to build a picture that is constantly dynamic and changing so that we can then say to the customer, you know, the consumer, the, the, the retailer, hey, you know, this product is starting to decline its popularity, so we're recommending you start to reduce your inventory you carry. And by the way, this product is, is, is gaining popularity, and we're going to drive a marketing campaign in your market to promote it. So now it will become a hot commodity. Please accept this recommendation and capitalize on that demand, and it will happen in the coming weeks. That, that, that's what we're aiming for. Mm-hmm. Do you see the partners being ready to accept that and wanting to stock the products that you're recommending? Like, are they trusting your guidance or has it been kind of an uphill battle uh, when it comes to those recommendations? Well, so first of all, the, 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 the primary segment we're focused on is, the, is that high frequency store, independent retailer, a C store, convenience store, uh, that, kind of, uh, that kind of customer segment. And they've been incredibly underserved for many years now. So any insight, that we've given them so far and the questions we've asked them about would this be of interest, they've all unanimous, unanimously said, th- th- this is what we've been asking for for years, please help me grow my business. So I mm-hmm. think the appetite is definitely there. That, yeah, that's, a, that's amazing. How do you set up platforms and systems for these different businesses? Because I could see each one needing something a little bit different. So how do you scale that model to provide the data to each company in a different way or each, like you said, store in a different way. Right. It has to be done without human intervention to start with. We, we cannot be responsible for building an army to support, you know, such mm-hmm. an endeavor. So um, at Kellogg, we're really focused on a single global platform, one ecosystem of applications that will scale uh, globally across markets and channels and the customer segments within these channels. Uh, with a, a lower cost of ownership as we scale it out. So that's the first, the first guiding principle. The second then is, if a machine can't do it, we probably shouldn't do it. So everything has got to be machine driven. And then by rewarding the, the owner operators to complete their profiles that allows us to capture information like, is your store rural, suburban or urban, gives us an, an, another great data point to then create more effective clustering. And then from these clusters, the, the analytics can be very powerful and the machine can then start to communicate through marketing automation on a, on a cadence that we could never possibly imagine before and then touch them with relevant content that is absolutely pertinent to their business. So I would make a recommendation to you in your store that you're missing these two products. You should, you should stock these. And if you do stock these, we predict that you will make X number of dollars you know, incrementally every year thereafter. And that's very powerful for conversion. Yeah, no, that, that's great. Were there any um, pitfalls or learnings when going about this partnership model and helping the retail stores that you saw along the way that you would advise maybe other companies or brands looking to do this, where you're like, hey, we ran into this problem along the way, or this was a big hiccup that other people could probably avoid if you listen to this podcast. Any advice around that? Well, it, I think it's going to be the same answer that nearly everybody gives, and that's mm-hmm. really focus on on education, change management. Uh, you know, it's you're, you're asking people to change their their, their habits. Mm-hmm. So, in, in emerging markets like Brazil, for us, high growth markets, they they there's a full service that the reps provide today, and so the. The store owners are accustomed to doing a particular style of business with us. We're asking them to change that and be more responsive from a digital perspective. Now, COVID 
you know, for all the the, 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 the bad and sadness that's come with, 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 with COVID, uh, it has been the catalyst for changing the perspective of, of many a retailer as to how they should interact with their brands. And so mm-hmm. that's, that's been the, 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 the silver lining of, of COVID is that it's elevated the, uh, the position of why B2B could be uh, a very important tool in, in their growth strategy going forward. And that's, that, that's changed the, the, the perspective consistently, considerably. Yeah, that's a good silver lining. So I, I saw that you also created a mobile app to reach some of the smaller retail clients. Can you tell me a bit about uh, what problem you were facing and why you thought mobile was the best way to solve that problem? Well, that's a really easy one. It's the business tool of choice for, for, for small yeah. business owners. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the internet and their mobile device and companies like Kellogg's are now developing you know, solutions, online solutions that, that years ago would have been financially out of reach. Now they have all these tools yeah. that they can run their business. And that's, that's, that's why mobile is so important to us. Got it. Do you ever feel like you're encumbered by trying to meet your partner obligations or that the experiences maybe can't be what you want them to be because of certain obligations you have with partners? No, I, I, I feel more, more enabled, to be honest, because you know, it, it's a difficult market. It, the times are always challenging. You know? So anything that might add value to a relationship, I think it goes a long way to, to creating you know, a, a winning business scenario. So I don't feel there's, there's any, any barriers, and maybe some adoption challenges, but those would have been there regardless. So I feel that there's such a large opportunity to use you know, e-commerce to change our engagement model that there's enough uh, partners in our network that are put their hand up or will put their hand up to say, yeah, I would love to be part of that because I can see that that could create competitive advantage for me. And alone, I can't do it. But in partnership with, with you, uh, I feel like that you could guide us and, and, and help us you know, uh, aspire to our own digital endeavors going forward. Yeah, completely agree. How do these retail partners keep track of all their other brands? So I'm thinking like if Kellogg's has their website that you would log into and you know you would look at the recommendations and your, get your orders and your inventory and all that kind of stuff, how would a retailer keep track of everything else they have in their store too? Is there like a single source that they can rely on or how do they think about that? So that's a great question and it's great. It's, 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 it's greatly misunderstood. Uh, you know, there is no real um, lifespan for a single application to serve a single brand in a retail environment. Who in their right mind would manage 50 different applications yeah. from different brands? So, um, so for, 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 for two, two different models, I, I, I foresee. So in a, in a mature disciplined distribution-based market, such as North America, uh, where most of our uh, distribution wholesale partners have a web presence today with, with e-commerce capabilities, we will be looking to integrate into that to improve the experience within that environment. So think of a, a, a store within a store concept, and, and that would be where I would see you know, brands like Kellogg's and others uh, prospering and allowing the the, the retailer to buy across a broad selection of products available from their distributor, but also to, to technically punch out to a rich My Kellogg experience where they can see their performance versus their peer group, to get the recommendations that we're offering, telling, you know, being informed about trends in, in, in product demand and so forth. And then you know, if they're, they're, they're inclined to convert on a recommendation we've given them, that product order will go back into the distributor environment to be processed in a normal fashion, thereby allowing them to continue to go about buying other products for their store. Mm-hmm. Now, in markets where distribution isn't as well evolved uh, from a digital perspective, then marketplaces become the, the, the answer to ensuring that a retailer can go to a, a, a marketplace designed for their customer segment with brands that represent at least 40% of their shelf so that there's enough for them to do in one execution to, to not create administration, but to, to reduce administration in the, in the procurement of product. Oh, got it, that makes sense. How do you think about working with different platforms? Like you just mentioned marketplaces, and I saw when you go on Kellogg's website, you direct people to go on platforms like Amazon and then also CVS and Target. How do you balance working with bigger stores and retail partners and then also platforms like Amazon within your Kellogg strategy for e-commerce? 
Well, there's a lot of room for improvement on both ends, you know. So at the at the end, you're referring to where you know the large platforms are, are in play. There's 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 a ton of upside to to improve content, to improve improve recommendations, to really get a deeper integration. Uh, that we can you take all that learning and insight and present it as a as a as a more refined offer that's dynamic. Uh, and obviously, the, the the price part architecture you know element of ensuring that you know what we're presenting is something that's scalable and, and profitable for us as well as a key uh, factor in these relationships at both ends. Uh, of course, I would say that they're not mutually exclusive in the sense that. Uh, you know, we can we can operate it in two two spectrums here. So it, it, the the large you know um, platform end, but also taking that technology and applying it to enable the uh, the long tail to prosper. Monetizing the long term the long tail is is actually a, a very worthy prize worth unlocking mm -hmm. for every you know CPG you know, company in the world. And I think that's where the, the low hanging fruit is to be honest today, because we do a great job uh, in most cases with our WalMarts and our Targets and our and our Amazons. Uh, we don't do a tremendous job today with our, our smaller, you know, high frequency stores, as an example. Yeah, that long tail does seem really important. How would you advise other CPG brands to uh, engage with those, like you said, the long tail? Do you know, I think partnerships are, are, are key. So, you know, whether this, wherever the synergistic, you know, product from more than one brand that would, you could curate into a collective offer, there is a lot of power in that. So strength in numbers, it's always been the case. We could, we could really you know, team up better in the industry to make a more powerful uh, proposition to our retailers that creates greater value, greater economies of scale, and it's easier to adopt. And I think that's what's missing today because everybody's a little nervous about working together, you know, trade secrets mm -hmm. and uh, will, will, yep. will the competition find out? And, you know, and honestly, in my entire career, uh, I've always had a hard time just getting our innovation execution done, never mind stealing somebody else's at the same time. Yeah. So in reality, it would never happen, but there's that insecurity that's, 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 that's common to human nature, I guess. Yeah, yeah, you see the same thing in startup world where people don't want to share their ideas and you're like, trust me, I've got my own stuff to work on. I'm not trying to steal your idea and build a whole nother startup on top of the stuff that I'm working on. <laughs> don't worry. It's so true. So how do you, have you seen any successes when it comes to those partnerships that you would advise others to like think about it this way when it comes to letting people, you know, lower down their guards and uh, allowing them to see like this could have benefit for everyone. Any successful case studies there? No, not, nothing, nothing as mature as a case study yet. We're still very much in the embryonic stage of developing this strategy. Um, you can see it though uh, in play from time to time when we do joint ventures with, with other brands targeted the consumer, to be honest. We, we, we did last year, we did a, we did a, a very exciting campaign with Cheez-Its and mm -hmm. House Wine, the House Wine, bo the box, box Wine Company. Ooh, and, uh, tell me more about that. Well, it was, it was very interesting and very simple. You know, it was a box wine, the box had been extended to, to uh, contain Cheez-Its and cheese and wine, as you know, is a perfect combination. Yes. And uh, so I, I personally was just eager to, to, to get my hands on a box. Yeah, and that morning it went live at nine o'clock and we sold everything in about 40 seconds, I believe. So none of us wow. got any. <laughs> so the, the, the power of- You're still on the wait list. Oh, it's never coming back, I don't think. We just- we, Oh no. We just take months to recover from the demand. <laughs> so um, yeah, Cheez-Its cheese doesn't need much help at the moment. We, we, as I said, we, we can't make enough to, to meet consumer demand. But that's a great example of you know, when you can join forces and just make the proposition more compelling. So I see that playing out in- in, in, in the B2B space uh, as well. And as I said before, together we're stronger. Yeah. How do you think about what partnerships are advantageous to have? It seems like it'd be kind of hard, you know, and, and I could see a lot of brands maybe partnering randomly where you're like, ah, eh, that's not really like even helpful to the consumer. So how would you think about striking up new partnerships in a way that's mutually beneficial to both brands and is good for a longer term strategy? Well, it depends. It depends what your ambition is, of course. So there'd be different different uh, solutions for for different approaches. I mean, obviously, you know, we wouldn't we wouldn't partner with uh, you know a Benjamin Moore paint brand. It's, there's no there's no correlation. So it, within within the food industry, you know, taking you know snacks as an example, you know, the the, the, the beverage industry is the perfect partner. You know, alcohol, cheese, it's and Pringles. You know, it's a it's it's a perfect combination. 
So, you know, the same is for, for, for cereal, you know, milk and yogurt. Uh, it's a perfect combination. So, so there's definitely uh, groupings of product where you can see, you know, which brands aspire to the same vision. It, it would be critically important as well. So just because the product uh, has synergy doesn't mean that the strategy is there. You, you can't force a, you know, a ram peg into a square hole. So my first, you know, uh, checkbox criteria would be, is the, is, the, is the digital ambition the same? Do, do both companies or do three or four companies aspire to own breakfast you know, across all hospitality in the world. Well, if we or if we do, then then we've got a common a common objective. Now, how do we go about it together? Is the next step. That's great. It seems like the larger brands too might have to kind of give a little bit more, or you know, provide a little bit more help to the smaller brands if they're picking someone. Like if you were partnering with a you know a, a smaller wine company or something, it seems like you might have to be ready to do maybe the eighty percent of the heavy lifting because maybe they don't have, you know, the resources or the budget. Is that kind of how you're seeing things play out when you pick partners that sometimes Kellogg's has to do the heavier lifting to create a partnership? Yeah, even even with with partnering some of the bigger brands, we're, 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 we're absolutely, you know, willing to do the heavy lifting. We, we made a decision, you know, with our leadership to, to own uh, our destiny in this space. So, you know, from top to bottom, and I do see that, small startups in, in, in an incubator fashion, we would be a great big brother uh, to get products launched. And we have our own startup, you know, business within Kellogg's where, you know, we, we're giving, you know, birth to products like leaf jerky and, and so forth, which is, you know, you know a, a different plant-based, you know, product that challenges the status quo of what we felt like, you know, jerky was in the past. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I can see that, you know, there could be market verticals that we would go after that might be, uh, you know, health club related before we joined the call, we were talking about RX bars and examples. So sold predominantly through through health clubs and so forth. So why not probiotic yogurts? Why not um, you know um, non non alcohol based beers? So so why not the combination? It's all all plays well to the health industry. So there might be some some small companies in there that are pioneering excellent alternatives. We would be I think more than delighted to partner with them. Yeah, no, that's great. So Kellogg's is over, they've been around for over 100 years, right? Since mm -hmm. it was 1906. Is that correct? Yes, correct. Okay, well, good memory, Stephanie. So with a company that's been around for that long, how do you think about making sure that the company continues to innovate? Like you said, you have a startup within Kellogg's. What do you see within that startup? What kind of um, products do you see coming out of that? And would you advise a lot of other large companies to also kind of put on their startup hat? To compete with these, you know, D2C companies that are all popping up everywhere. Well, you know, change has become the new norm. I mean, taking COVID aside, uh, you know, people want to taste new things. They want to, you know, that's is my 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 impression anyway. I think you know, there's a, there's a, there's an appetite for for new and more challenging flavors and so forth. So in the food industry, I can see that you know the innovation around our our product offer is absolutely critical for success. But the, the, the innovation doesn't stop there, though. We have to be more innovative in how we present these products, you know, how we you know, ensure these products create value, other than just in flavor, but in health and well-being as well. So, you know, Kellogg's has always been a, a very, you know, health-driven business uh, right from right from its inception. So, you know, that that continues to be an underpinning philosophy of our, of our company. And I see a, a great deal of passion in our business an investment for, for, you know, innovation. And it spreads, it's not just digital, it's all the way down to food and our innovation kitchens and, and, and the chefs we have that are inspired to, to, to really, you know, find new products. And we, we do a great job of creating an incubator within our business by constantly searching for ideas within our employee base around what mm -hmm. we could do with, with, with Kellogg products. So I think you look inwards and outwards, there's no, to, no stone worth, not turning over to find a, a, an idea about a new product. Yeah, that makes sense. When you mentioned marketing earlier, it seems like you would have to kind of market to two different audiences. You have to market to your retail partners and then also to the consumers. How do you go about, you know, maybe within your platform where you're selling to retailers, do you market differently than how you do to consumers or how do you think about that? Well, so now you bring up, uh, you know, an interesting subject in the sense that you know, direct to consumer, which clearly sets outside of B two B, does provide you with the an, an awesome channel to test mm -hmm. you know the appeal of new product at a 
an affordable cost if you engineer it appropriately uh, so that you've got something you can stand up and tear down quite quickly without major investment. You know, I don't know if you would really want to continually be knocking on the door of your retailers with new products without having some good market data behind it to say that this will sell. And so testing that product in market uh, becomes a critical part of the evolution of the go-to-market strategy. Uh, and so, so I see direct consumer testing being, being a, a very uh, interesting proposition for, for companies like Kellogg's going forward. Got it. So you test the product with a market first and then you go to your partners and say, hey, a lot of people like this. You should also put this in your store. Absolutely, because that's where we get the scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we can we can then turn on you know all of our abilities to cross sell and use you know some of the some of the, the capabilities we talked earlier about in, in the B2B platform and ensuring that our retailers know how to create success with new product. It's, it, there's another interesting you know um, aspect of that too. So if you go back to the conversation around the long tail of retail, the, the, these these companies these these business owners don't have you know, sophisticated inventory management tools. So one of, the, one of the biggest challenges we're solving for is ensuring that new products are products that we've recommended for that retailer when they're placed, that they stay. Because we see a lot of you know, occasions where a new product has been placed or a product from the portfolio that they should be adopting has been taken. And then uh, weeks later, it's been sold and never replaced because somebody in the evening has just redistributed product on the shelf to complete the look. Uh, and that, mm. that position has been lost. And so making sure that these products are reordered and reordered again until they become habitual, you know, their presence is habitual on the shelf is a massive opportunity. So it's not about just new product you know, innovation, it's also about ensuring the, the stickiness of product they are placing on the shelf. What ways do you engage with your partners to make sure that they, like you said, keep reordering? Have you seen any best practices to stay top of mind with these people to, you know, even if they do accidentally lose a spot in the shelf, they're like, oh, hey, you know, this, this product actually belongs there. How do you go about building those patterns? Well, there's, all, there's all sorts of technology becoming available from scanning, you know, to just constant recognition. So there's, there, there are solutions coming. They're not particularly affordable today for, for, for the segment we've been, we've been addressing, which is the high frequency store segment. So the, the, the challenge has been resolved by, you know, manpower up until now. And of course, that's not very affordable. Yeah. It, it's interesting when you go to markets like India, if, if you don't show up, some other, somebody else will steal your space, you know, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's very cutthroat. Maybe you lose. I, I know. So, 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 so there's a whole bunch of dilemmas around, you know, making sure that you, you hold on to the shelf space that you've worked so hard to, to attain. Uh, so we, we're looking at things, tools like, you know, um, asking, asking our retailers to take shelfies. Uh, using their, their, their mobile cameras and uploading that shelfies. Image. Yeah, shelf. <laughs> Tell me yeah. more about a shelfie. So a, a shelfie is you know just a, you know, the, the shelf equivalent of your, your selfie uh, in the sense that we'll, we'll, we're looking to set challenges for our retailers to say, listen, take a shelfie of your of your of your CEO display, and then we'll match that that image to the planogram that the AI has in its memory, and then give them a score, and that score will then be translated into into points, color points that they can use for. For, for purchasing you know, everything from a discount to cleaning services, say for instance, in the future. One thing that happens you know, in, in, our, in, in, in this process is that we ask somebody to do a challenge. Before they actually take their picture, there's a pretty good chance they're going to address any gaps on their shelf. So we see it being a little self-serving and, uh, and you know, helping, helping us get a better you know, position in the store, but also then just educating the, the, the retailer around best practice and reinforcing that practice so the look of success is getting closer and closer and the perfect store is within their reach. So that's just uh, just one example, I guess. Yeah, no, that, that's awesome. That's a really fun example. Have you seen the rewards program that you have actually really incentivize these retailers to, like you said, take these shelfies and engage with your brand more? Now, again, you're doing me far too much justice. I talk, I talk with the with authority, but we're still very much in the theory and the testing. The technology is still catching up. But we see mm -hmm. rewards, and we have a rewards engine built into our platform today. We're really, we haven't really turned it on to its full force yet, but it, it will be a cornerstone of our strategy. We're looking at gamification and rewards and recognition as being a key driver of behavior going forward and you know, creating the path to best practice. So mm -hmm. it, will, it will be a constant in our engagement strategy. So at eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, we'll be 
connecting with uh, an owner operator of a store through WhatsApp or email or text to say, listen, we have a challenge for you. And this challenge is worth a thousand Kellogg points. If you go and take that shelfie, or if you um, can tell us, answer this question about this, the, the new product you recently stocked, you know, how quickly did it sell out? Did customers you know, come back and repurchase? Did you get any feedback in any shape or fashion about the flavor? Uh, what did they think? And, and, and reward them for that first party data insight. Now all of a sudden you've got this incredible ability to, to, to harvest information that could be you know, invaluable to your R&D teams. At the same time, you've got the opportunity to influence best practice and, you know, take the customer on a journey, the customer being the retail owner operator, on a journey to become, to become better at their craft, which is super exciting to us. No, that, that's really awesome. It seems like there'd be room too to kind of build a community among these store owners to all do the challenges together and to talk about best practices. Have you all explored that? We're exploring it. We're definitely exploring it. So, it, you know, it came from when we looked at one of our our, our, our customer segments being uh, K through 12. So uh, schools starting here in North America, there's a lot of schools that are rural, um, that are isolated, you know, that they don't have large you know, school communities to, 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 be, to support them. And there's so many challenges that they face from, you know, allergies and, you know, health and nutrition taking food and making an education subject matter, uh, all of these things we're looking into to say, okay, so a community together would be, would be again stronger. So connect schools that are, that are similar together and then connect schools that are not similar and, and let them use, you know, a product as a, as a, as a teaching aid. So, you know, we, we, we aspire, and this is, this is a long way away from happening. So, so, so please don't, take this as a, something that's been executed today, but we can see that uh, sometime in the future, we'll create a syllabus around, you know, corn and, you know, our, our corn flakes and how it changes the flavor patterns in Japan compared to, you know, Idaho. Uh, and there's two schools and their kids having their breakfast, they can share the differences in the sweetness and so forth because the, the terroir, um, the, the, the climate is different. So the, the plant takes on a different flavor. And so that's a subject that you could turn into a, to a syllabus and education and bring kids together. And yeah, it is a very exciting proposition for us and different from anything we've ever done before. Yeah, that's awesome. And I did not know that flavors around the world would be different. So you definitely taught me something brand new here. Yeah, we've, we've, we've done a few things in, 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 in Kellogg's in the office in Chicago where uh, they've, uh, they've taken five or six, you know, or seven different uh, sources of cornflakes and put them all in. In, in independent bowls unmarked and then tasted them and people were, were, were convinced that sugar had been applied and so forth and it absolutely hadn't. It's just that this, the, the, the different produce, you know, produce different flavors and it was quite quite a, an epiphany for, for many of the folks tasting them. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. So when it comes to um, your B2B platform, what are some of the best capabilities that you're using today that maybe you weren't using a year or two ago? Well, again, cornerstone of what I'm trying to do with, with, with the BB platform is, is, is you know, create efficiency. Mm -hmm. And so to create efficiency, the first thing I'm trying to tackle is preventing any waste of time as it pertains to identifying a product. So we are integrating scan into, into the, the mobile device using the mobile device camera. Uh, quickly scan that barcode, we will take you straight to the product in our platform. So no need to key in, no need to, to type in the barcode or any keywords that are associated with that product. Quick scan, within, within less than a second, you're, you're on the, the product detail page and you've got a path to purchase with one click. Uh, you've got a path to understand your performance versus your peer group with one click. And you've got a path to understand how to sell more by accessing the tools that would give you the, uh, give you the, the, the toolkits that, that will help you do that. So that's, that's one aspect. The second aspect is to create value around ensuring that big data is, is converted into um, some form of, of executable logic that says that, hey, you are not carrying the optimal product assortment. You know, companies, businesses, stores like you uh, sell these products successfully and you're missing uh, revenue as a result of not taking them. So here's a recommendation for these products. Here's the stock and quantity that we believe you should take. And uh, here's a revenue prediction based on you know, MSRP uh, from the cluster you belong to. That, that to me is, is, is transformational in, in, in so many ways. So are you using 
AI behind the scenes to create a lot of these recommendations? And do you think a lot of brands are also doing this or is there a lot of room for them to adopt to this technology? Yeah, AI is, 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 is the key to success. So we've talked about AI for, for several years now and it's really not delivered you know, what it says in the box as of yet. But I'm 100% confident we're getting closer and closer all the time. Anybody that, that's been dealing with AI knows that there's a lot of teaching goes into, in, into the logic that supports the output. But we're definitely getting closer to to being able to use it at scale, and you know what I see in the next you know year to twenty four months will be the ability to then turn on that 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 dynamic um, self sustaining logic that continues to 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 morph as it reads more data and continue to present very tailored recommendations to to uh, to all of our retailers worldwide simultaneously because computing power. Uh, obviously continues to scale at an exponential rate. It doesn't do necessarily what it needs to do today, but the path is now clear. And I think it's just, just around the corner, to be honest. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Are you all um, training your own models for AI? Are you relying on a platform to help you with that? Like, how would you recommend another brand or larger or smaller brands to kind of start adopting this technology or start experimenting with it? Well, there's a lot of data scientists out there, and you know, and they're all better at it than, than than I am for sure. So, you know, you we, sure? <laughs> yeah, I'm absolutely positive. So <laughs> we um we we've been looking outward uh, to you know smaller businesses as well as some of our larger partners to use their experience because clearly they see the opportunity too. So you know, I would continue to just make sure that you're using a blend of traditional, you know, partnerships and, you know, innovative new businesses that come up with some left field idea about how to resolve one of the challenges. Uh, you know, I'm constantly looking, you know, for, for new ideas uh, from the marketplace, from, from the periphery, uh, where, you know, there's new startups starting and looking for an edge and, you know, they might have a great concept that, that we can we can use. And it, I often create it to, some of you might see in a, a, a Paris fashion show where uh, coming in the runways is, is, a, is a, a presentation that could be quite outrageous, but some form of it will get to the high street that will be very popular with, with the consumer. So uh, mm -hmm. a really wild idea can really translate and be boiled down to something that can be a game changer um, you know, in reality. So, so ne never assume that it's, it, it has to be something that's already you know, in place but to be open to suggestion. And I try and work on a daily basis to be that way. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good lesson too, to kind of look at tangential markets and industries that could also help influence not only new products, but also e-commerce strategies and just kind of like keeping tabs on what other people are doing, especially startups who are moving quickly and experimenting quickly. How do you keep tabs on companies like that and kind of stay up to date with what other people are trying? Well, in prior lives, working for brands that were less recognized it was it was on me to to continue to search and find you know and have you know encourage my team to continue to to look for uh you know these these innovations uh working for a, a brand like kellogg's the, the, there's a lot of people come calling so i, I i'm obviously in a fortunate position to be exposed to a lot of these on you know ideas on a day-by-day -day basis from from various entrepreneurs you know, they mm -hmm. uh, feel that Kellogg could prosper from, you know, taking on their, their idea. So that, that, that role has changed. So, you, so I'm very fortunate in that regard to be exposed to some great, you know, ideas, you know, across, across the industry. And not just from within, uh, you know, the food and beverage industry, as an example, but from sending it up to, uh, you know, you, you name it, aerospace. There is, there's a lot of innovation going on. What is your definition of success for e-commerce? What kind of metrics do you look at? Uh, what do you think is successful? Yes. Okay. So none of the traditional metrics are really going to be of any interest. Uh, Ooh. <laughs> so for, 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 for me, the, the, the um, success has moved upstream. When I think about what does success look like from a digital perspective in B2B, it's very much around ensuring that, that, that the retailer is, is selling more products more effectively and more efficiently and putting more money in their pocket. Mm -hmm. So if I, can, if I can look back and say, that you know, the, the, all the retailers that, that we supply products are prospering as a result of our e-commerce engagement because we're delivering not just the fundamentals of e-commerce, which is about you know order management and everything else that comes with it. That's just 
table stakes, whatever else comes with it, uh, where we create the value through AI recommendations, access to toolkits, marketing campaigns, uh, you, you know, guidance on, on, on how to create the perfect store. If that's translating into, into more dollars at the point of sale, then that's what success looks like in B2B commerce going forward, in my opinion. Yeah, it seems like that partnership and education is really important in B2B. How, how have you guys seen success with doing that? Well, again, I, I wish I had something much more tangible to give you in terms of the successful metrics. This is still ground zero. We're still very much in, in, in day one of our B2B engagement. And I think you'll find that modern B2B is still in day one globally across most industries. So there's, there's still a lot, of, a lot of learning, a lot of testing, um, a lot of refinement to do, but the appetite is there. Uh, the, you know, when I talk to other brands, they feel the same way about you know, how we can harness technology to create value. And when the, when I, the retailers I've talked to, they're, they're hungry. And so is our, our, our distributor and wholesaler partners too, to participate in this new era of you know, one-on-one engagement at scale that's affordable and you know, at a, uh, a cadence that has never been achievable before. And just that combination of uh, menu items is, is really driving the hunger to get to, there, get to that point quicker. I wish I could go quicker. Uh, we're definitely trying to get there quicker, but it, it, it just takes time to build. And so ask me again in, in, in six or 12 months and I'll be in a far stronger position to give you a better answer. Oh, you just invited yourself to round two. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, so with things changing so quickly, are there any new or emerging digital channels that you all are focused on or trying out? Uh, so, you know, again, comes back to just watching and keeping an eye on, you know, how things are changing. An example would be, uh, let's see, WhatsApp, for instance. So WhatsApp starts life as a messaging tool, becomes incredibly popular worldwide, uh, you know, supplanting email, uh, phone, texting, everything. Mm-hmm. Now WhatsApp is developing, you know, the online ordering capability that will uh, potentially change the trajectory of B2B commerce. So we're watching it very, very carefully. But there's a caveat. There's so much low hanging fruit in just doing what we already know we can do better in B2B commerce. The, the, uh, the, the WhatsApp example would be a very shiny object that, while we still need to, to continue to look at disruptive opportunities, uh, we need to temper our, our enthusiasm to be, dis, to be distracted. It can't be a distraction. We, we know that um, there's enough revenue potential uh, just executing our primary mission without you know, chasing rabbits down holes. Uh, I don't want to be you know, the anti-innovator, but there's got to be a balance. So I use... I use three, three words to kind of caution myself, stop better and clever. Stop doing things that create no value. Identify what you're doing well, but do it better. And you know, save Friday afternoons for the clever things. Still Friday afternoons are dedicated to it, but you know, don't let it become all consuming. And that's, that's, that's how I approach this. That's great. That's a really good lesson. Friday afternoons with a beer, maybe? Then you're even more creative, right? <laughs> Why not? Yeah, I certainly, my, 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 my wine consumption during COVID has gone up tremendously. <laughs> I, I think everyone does. So are there any B2B commerce trends that you're excited about that are coming down over the next couple, well, maybe even in the next year? Well, I just think the fact that the, the chatter around B2B is, 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 is climbed exponentially in the last three or four months is, is, is exciting. Uh, I'm super excited about you know what machine learning can do uh, for for scale and just enabling us to do the, the value added services that we've aspired to do but couldn't execute because of the cost. So these two these two two elements that the B two B you know is is becoming a a cornerstone of business strategy and it's not seen to be as a poor cousin of B two C. B two B can be sexy. Uh, we're taking all the goodness from from the, ex- the user experience and applying it, but then with this this logic, this data driven, that's hard to to uh, to turn down when we recommend uh, you know products to a particular owner operator that have got a revenue projection associated with them. That that's that's a hard proposition. Plus, we're giving them an award for accepting the recommendation. If that recommendation comes any place close to, to our prediction, 
then I think conversion could be 100% going forward. Now, in digital, we usually a 2% conversion on an action was great. 100% conversion, wow, that's perfect execution. What does that do to the industry? Truly transformational. Yeah, completely agree. So when it comes to implementing technology and stuff, you know, because I think, like you said, a lot of people and a lot of platforms are focusing on B2B now. It is the new player to kind of look at where B2C was maybe the sexier area before. How would you advise other companies to think about onboarding new technologies and tools in a way that sets them up for long-term success? Well, first of all, think, think scrappy. You, you, can't, you can't innovate uh, with, with the mindset of perfection. And large companies, I think, suffer more than small companies. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a process and procedure and you know, there's, there's an ROI calculation and there's a certain set of expectations. So, you know, especially when you're dealing with, with you know, technology that can't quite deliver on the initial promise, but you have a fairly confident um, you know, perspective on it will get there. So, so you have to be a little ashamed of what you're taking to market because quite frankly, in my experience, uh, you, you see the flaws, whereas the target audience does not. They see something different, something value added. They know it's a work in, work in progress and they can, they can see it resolves a pain point. It removes all of the, the inadequacies of what you didn't do as a result of getting to market quicker and testing a reaction. So that would be my recommendation. Be a little ashamed. Yeah. Be a little ashamed about what you go to market with initially. So is there anything that we didn't cover that you want to cover before we move on to the lightning round? Oh, no, I didn't know there was going to be a lightning round. <laughs> yes, there's a lightning round. That's a little scary. <laughs> yeah, but anything high level e-commerce trends, uh, the industry that you're like, man, I really wish Stephanie asked this question and she just didn't. No, I don't, I don't think so. I, I think we covered off the fact that I think the biggest thing that's missing in the industry is, is that more, more collaboration. Mm-hmm. You know, I think collaboration is, is, is going to be a, a game changer in terms of you know, driving success. So that's, that's what I'm, I'm seeking to build through networking and you know, working with other brands to try and find some common ground we can exploit. So you know, if, anybody is, if anybody's interested, you know, please reach out to me and I'd be happy to partner. Yeah, I completely agree. That's great. All right. So the lightning round brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud is where I ask a question and you have one minute or less to answer. Are you ready, Rob? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. You're ready. What's up next in your cereal bowl? Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm Scottish. It should be porridge, but it isn't. Oh. <laughs> I don't like porridge. I am a, no? I am a diehard Frosties guy. I don't know. I can't. There's not, there's not a bad time in the day to consume Frosties. So that's, that's what's always in my cereal bowl. I agree. That is a delicious choice. What's up next on your Netflix queue? Netflix. I've just finished watching Altered Carbon, and mm. it was a book that I'd read, three books I'd read many, many years ago, and it was actually a really good rendition of of uh, of, uh, of the of the novel. So I thought it's 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 sci-fi. It's very forward-looking. It's probably what you'd expect me to watch, but I thought I enjoyed that series. Yeah, that that sounds great. What's up next on your podcast list or Audible? Yeah, so podcasts. I was, I, during during COVID, I, I I mean, I listen to a lot of podcasts, especially at nighttime, and um, I've started to 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 rediscover you know vinyl, and so I've become a bit of a pseudo audiophile, a wannabe at least. I can't afford the big stuff, but I, I'm, I'm working my way into it. So I started to listen to 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 various audiophile uh, podcasts, which have been fantastically interesting. But sadly, yeah. they're talking about technology I can't afford or justify. My wife keeps a very close eye on me. So, <laughs> so, so oh, man, so rude of her. <laughs> I know. Terrible, isn't it? But logical. She, she, she saves me from myself. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that's really fun. Well, if you were to have a guest on a podcast of your own, so if you were to have the Rob Burst podcast and you wanted to bring on your first guest, who would you bring and why? Oh, that's easy. That's easy. I am a big soccer fan from the UK and one of my one of my idols is Sir Alex Ferguson. I would love mm-hmm. him to be uh, <laughs> my, my first guest on a podcast. He has such great insight into leadership, management, the stories he has, uh, you know, just he would be, he would, there's an entire encyclopedia of subjects we could discuss and he's, uh, he's an idol of mine. That would be a fun one. I would listen to your podcast. Good. <laughs> All right. The last hard question, what one thing will have the biggest impact on e-commerce in the next year? One thing. I think changing, changing a, 
the, 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 the culture within companies to, to really embrace innovation, uh, you know, not to necessarily wipe the, uh, the investment and make a net positive operating gain uh, in the short term, but to be more, 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 more risk orientated. Uh, you know, I see a lot of challenges around, you know, investment strategies and payback periods and so forth. And it really does slow down our ability to go to market. So if we can get to a point where there's an acceptable uh, investment tolerance, and that will obviously vary by company size and profitability, then I'd like to see more of a, 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 an entrepreneurial approach to taking that, that startup fund and internally and going to market with it, improving proving a success or a failure. In Kellogg's, we've tremendous, done a tremendous job recently of celebrating failures. We've never an award for the PISA award uh, for, for failure. So it, it, it's a transformation that's underway, but we still have to get you know, more comfortable with, with you know, um, capital investment uh, that can be used to experiment rather than you know, the, the business case that supports it long term, which it will come, that will come when we determine what the metrics are and what the levers that work that can be, can be expanded upon and so forth. So that, that's what I'm looking for. I love it. You are a lightning round expert, so nice job. Thank you. Well, it's been a blast having you on the show. Where can people learn more about you and Kellogg's? Well, they can they can see my profile on LinkedIn. Obviously, I, I'm not a, a big social media user today, um, so you know, reach out to me through through LinkedIn, and um, I'd be uh, I'd be happy to to engage. Awesome! Thanks for coming on the show, Rob. It's been a blast, and we will have to bring you back since we have an invitation now for round two. We'll have to bring you back in the future. That was a mistake, wasn't it? <laughs> no mistake. We'll have even more fun then. <laughs> I look forward to it. Thank you very much for for having me on. It's a great pleasure. Up Next in Commerce is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud and created by the team at mission.org. Subscribe now at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts.